If asked about the most successful aircraft in World War I, I would answer. It was the Sopwith Camel. It shot down more enemy planes than any other fighter of any warring nation. From the perspective of modern man and it made a strong impression on me. During World War I, early aerial tactics used only balloons and aircraft for observation, as a means of artillery detection and information gathering. But as the need to block enemy observation grew, fighters equipped with synchronized guns were introduced to both sides, and air combat or air combat was born. For Force Center, the German Fokker Eindecker was their most successful fighter. And for the Allies, that title goes to the Sopwith Camel. But what makes this British fighter so effective and so important? Let's find out in today's video. Before the Sopwith Camel appeared in the wartime skies, there was its equally important predecessor, the Sopwith Pup. In October 1916, the first of these arrived on the Western Front. In the last months of 1916, the 8th Squadron RNAS destroyed 20 enemy aircraft on the Somme battlefield. But while they proved successful, Sopwith pups were outmatched by updated German fighters, including the Albatross D-3, which spurred the development of the superior Sopwith Camel. The main requirements for Sopwith Camel are simple, heavier weapons, more agility, and increased speed. With designs led by chief designer Herbert Smith, the new aircraft was dubbed the Big Pup, although its official designation was the Sopwith F.1. The inclusion of a metal shield on the stock, designed to keep the gun from freezing at high altitudes, resulted in a hump shape, leading pilots to refer to this new aircraft as the Sopwith Camel. The museum Sopwith Camel is often on display in the Fraser Valley. Several questions are often asked when camels are on display. How does the engine rotate when the propeller is moved? What is the small propeller on the strut used for? Why isn't the propeller fired when the pilot fires the gun? Here are some interesting technical aspects of camel. Remember that in 1916 only 13 years had passed since the Wright brothers flew a controllable plane. And the first international flight from France to England was most recently in 1909. At the time, the Camel was a combat machine as advanced as the CF-18 today. In 1916, the Germans controlled the skies over the trenches, and the British developed three fighters to regain control of the air battle. The best and most famous of these three designs is the Sopwith Camel. Small and light. The Camel represented the latest fighter design at the time. Sopwith Camel shot down 1,294 enemy aircraft during World War I, more than any other Allied fighter. However, flying was so difficult that more men lost their lives learning to fly than using it in combat. A total of 5,490 Camels were built. The Sopwith Company launched the first Camel in December 1916. The Camel was a revolutionary machine in several respects. The aircraft's two Vickers machine guns were mounted side by side in front of the cockpit. A first for British fighters and a design feature that became standard on British fighters for almost 20 years. 5. Second, the pilot, engines, armament, and controls were all crammed into a seven-foot space at the front of the plane. This gave the plane a phenomenal performance, but it also made the plane very difficult to fly. In addition, the aircraft's wood and fabric construction and lack of protection for the fuel tanks made the Camel very susceptible to fire. Furthermore, the poor state of pilot training between 1916-1917 meant that the average life expectancy of a British pilot was just over two weeks. The name Camel is derived from the hump-shaped sheath on the machine gun. To counter the Zeppelins, Navy Camels were flown from barges towed behind destroyers, from the turrets of larger ships, as well as from early aircraft carriers. A Camel 2F.1 successfully flew after crashing from a balloon a test that tested a spacecraft's ability to carry defensive aircraft. Let's learn about the rotary engine of this plane. To try and answer the why and how of rotating motors is not easy 90 years after they are widely used. First, 
clarify the terms rotation and radial as applied to aircraft engines. Both designs have cylinders radially arranged around the crankcase, i.e. the cylinder centerlines intersect at the crankshaft. The main difference is that with a rotary engine the cylinders rotate around a fixed crankshaft, while on a radial engine the cylinders are fixed and the crankshaft rotates. In the first case, the propeller is attached to the cylinder, while in the latter case it is connected to the crankshaft. Do you know about the rotary engine? Why would engineers create an engine that seems illogical by today's standards? Considering that powered flight only began a decade before World War I, I, and powered flight only in 1909, it's clear that a lot of innovative ideas were being tested at the time. The first aircraft engines were adaptations of motor vehicle engines where weight was not a major issue. Curtis and Renault's liquid-cooled V8 aircraft engines were heavy and unreliable. Trust. For the fighter designer, it is imperative to have a high-powered engine to keep the weight as low as possible. The rotary motor can meet these needs and weighs 3 lb. Per horsepower. A significant improvement over the inline rotary motors run at low RPM resulting in high pulses from each power stroke. One method to reduce this is to use a flywheel. However, in the rotary, the cylinders and propeller act as a flywheel, thus saving weight. Another advantage of the rotary design is that the cylinders are cooled by the passing air even when the aircraft is stationary. Given the state of the engine's development at this time, it was difficult to find metal that wouldn't deform with the heat required for a high-powered motor. On the negative side, rotary-powered aircraft suffer from a significant gyroscope effect of large rotating masses. This effect causes the aircraft to yawn every time it changes its attitude. When taking off at low speed, simply raising the tail to gain airspeed will cause a left turn. When the nose is raised to lift off the ground, the aircraft will kick to the right. Turns in flight create strong force from the nose up or down, resulting in very strong right and very poor turns to the left. Rotary has poor fuel consumption due to limited throttle and very high oil consumption due to a total loss oil system, i.e. oil is pumped out of the cylinder during combustion and not returned. Oil tank again. The engine's advantage in relatively lightweight was partially offset by the suction power of the cylinders. That is, when the engine rotates, the cylinders create drag, a small factor at lower speeds, but the penalty increases as speed increases. Part of the engine power was used to turn the engine against air resistance. Next is about how the motor rotates. When one realizes that these engines have rotating cylinders, Several technical questions come to mind. How does the fuel-air mixture get to the cylinders if they are constantly changing positions? Also, how is a spark sent to the spark plugs if they are also in motion? This description includes the Clergit engine, a typical WW1 rotary engine, built by thousands of people in France and England. To start from the beginning of the fuel-air cycle, we can look at the primary carburetor located at the end of the crankshaft at the rear of the engine. An air intake manifold enters from each side of the engine to the carburetor. A fuel line delivers fuel through a gauge needle. The pilot's throttle controls the air valve and fuel gauge. The fine adjustment of this needle allows for fuel control to deliver precise mixtures at high altitudes. The fuel-air mixture then passes through the hollow crankshaft to the crankcase, where it is evenly mixed by the rotating engine parts. It is then led from the crankcase through an external inlet manifold to the top of the cylinder. The combustible mixture is fed directly out of the cylindrical tube so that there is no ductwork. To ensure adequate fuel supply to the engines during all operations, fuel from the fuselage-mounted tank was pressurized by an air pump. On some aircraft, this is an engine-mounted pump. On others, the pump is driven by a small propeller mounted on a wing just above the fuselage. The pilot also has a pump mounted in the cockpit that is used when starting the engine. Lubricating oil is also distributed through the crankshaft. 
A relatively easy task as the plumbing easily attaches to the inside of the fixed crankshaft. From here, it is led through drilled passages to the various components that require lubrication. A well-known feature of rotary engines is the use of castor oil. The reason is lost until we examine the lubrication system in detail. When fuel and oil are mixed in the crankcase, the fuel mustn't dissolve the oil and damage its lubricating qualities. The perfect choice is pharmaceutical quality castor oil. It will withstand heat and centrifugal force, and its tendency to gel is unsuitable in total loss lubrication systems. An unfortunate side effect was that the pilot inhaled and swallowed a significant amount of oil during the flight, which resulted in persistent diarrhea. This also explains the pilot's use of a flowing white scarf, not to create a dandy image, but to wipe goggles from the persistent oil mist that flows through the cockpit. Now that we have fuel and oil flowing to the engine, the third essential component is the medium that provides the spark for combustion. Typically, these engines use a dual ignition unit to provide a reliable source of ignition. The magnets are mounted on the fixed rear housing of the motor. The spark is delivered to the cylinders through a brush in contact with a rotating distributor plate, and then through a copper wire to the spark plug. Earlier engines, such as the Monosupape, needed a pilot-operated switch to deactivate the ignition to reduce engine power. However, Clergit in the camel has enough throttling so that although the stamping switch is retained, it is rarely needed. A variety of inlet and exhaust valve configurations were used on early engines. Clergit has separate valves controlled by pushrods operated by a cam mechanism at the front of the engine. Valve springs are a major weakness, as material strength is often inadequate, leading to frequent drain valve failures. As with radial engines, most rotary engines use the main rod that is attached to the crankshaft. Around the periphery of the main bar are attached auxiliary bars from the remaining pillars. The piston was originally made of cast iron but was later made of an aluminum alloy, which resulted in significant weight savings. The design of the cylinders has undergone a learning process incorporating improvements in materials. Larone posts are made of steel with cast iron lining. Clergit cylinders are machined in nickel steel from solid billet to 3 mm thickness. And featured integrated cylinder heads. Overheating and deformation of these cylinders are a problem. The later 150 horsepower Bentley BR1 featured several improvements as Woe Bentley designer worked on the Clergit engine. Cylinder barrel made from aluminum with shrink liners. Pistons are also aluminum, detachable cylinder head, and the cylinders can be disassembled without disassembling the engine. Bentley's second engine, the BR2 was the most powerful rotary engine of World War I, producing 235 horsepower with a power-to-weight ratio of 2 pounds per horsepower. This engine powers the Sopwith snipe that Major Barker won the Victoria Cross. After World War I, the rotary engine was phased out, as larger power output meant larger diameter and weight resulting in unacceptable gyroscopic forces. The radial, inline, and V engines took over until the turbine engine came out less than 25 years later. Another interesting thing is, why is the propeller not fired when the pilot fires the gun? The question that will eventually be addressed concerns the guns mounted on top of the crawling engines and dangerously pointed at the spinning propellers. From the very beginning of the war, attempts were made to find a way to fire machine guns through propellers. A French manufacturer, Raymond Salnier, has developed a system that allows pilots to fire only when the propeller is off target. The first versions do not work properly. In the early months of 1915, French pilot Roland Garros added deflector plates to the blades of his Moraine Salnier's propellers. These small wedges of tempered steel redirected the path of bullets hitting the blades. He was now able to use a forward-fired machine gun, and on April 1, 1915, he went out looking for his first victim. Garros approaches a German albatross reconnaissance plane. 
The accepted air combat strategy at the time was to shoot the dead with a revolver or rifle. Instead, Garrow shot down Albatross through his spinning propeller. Over the next two weeks, Garrow shot down four more enemy planes. However, the success was short-lived as Garros was forced to land behind German lines and before he could set fire to his machine, it was captured by the Germans. It was immediately sent to Anthony Fokker, a Dutch designer manufacturing aircraft at his factory in Germany. After testing the deflector blades on Moraine Salnier, Fokker and his designers decided to take it one step further by developing a program interrupt mechanism. A cam attached to the engine's crankshaft aligns with each propeller blade. When the blade reaches a position where it can be hit by a machine gun projectile, the associated cam activates a pushrod, by a series of links, preventing the gun from firing. Once the blade is clear, the links will retract, allowing the gun to fire. In December 1915, the Vickers Challenger interrupter entered production for the Royal Flying Corps and within a few weeks, a similar order for the Scarf Dubovsky device was placed for the RNAs. Nor is it a clone of the Fokker device, as work on both is advanced before a captured Fokker is available for technical analysis. The first British aircraft to use these gears was the Sopwith 1.5 Strutter, which shipped in April 1916. By March 1917, the British had introduced a new form of synchronous machine based on hydraulics rather than mechanical linkages. Developed by Romanian inventor George Constantinescu, the Constantinescu synchronous device uses pulses transmitted by a column of liquid to trigger the gun. This improvement is more reliable than previous methods and also provides a faster rate of fire that is close to that of a conventional machine gun and is independent of engine revolutions. CC armament remained standard on British fighters until the beginning of World War II. The La Rhone camels are equipped with hydraulic Constantinesco intermittent gear, while the Clergit camels have the less efficient third Sopwith copper mechanical synchronous gear. One of the camel's most distinctive features is its amazingly fast right turns. This comes from the combination of the aircraft's forward weight and the torque of its powerful rotary engines. That is a unique feature of this fighter. The pilots made good use of that right turn to gain an advantage over the opponent. In some cases, they even used a 270 degrees right turn instead of the slower 90 degrees left turn. This ability comes with a downside. Engine torque means that the nose of the plane will try to turn downhill while turning right. On the contrary, it tends to climb steeply when turning left. The former trend is much more dangerous for pilots and is yet another reason why camels have no tolerance for an inexperienced flyer. Next, let's take a look at how camels participated in some of the war's most notable aerial skirmishes. On March 24, 1918, during the Battle of Cambrai, camel pilot J. L. Trollope destroyed six enemy planes in one day. On April 21, 1918, Canadian pilot Roy Brown flew a camel to fight against German troops including Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen. The Red Baron was Germany's greatest trump card of the war, one who defined the fighter jet. He was killed in this battle and Brown is one of those who are said to have been killed. During the final German night raid on the 20th or the 21st of May 1918, a combination of 74 Sopwith Camels and RAF SE-5 intercepted 28 German Gothas and Zeppelin Stacken RV. This resulted in the German bombers suffering their heaviest defeat in a single night on British soil, with three bombers shot down by aircraft and two others under anti-aircraft fire. Another interesting news is that, when the Americans entered the war, the British provided them with camels, and many people refused to fly them because it was too dangerous. Others did and at least two squadrons were fitted. Camels also served as night fighters in both home defense and France and were surprisingly successful. Many accidents among blue-shirt pilots are caused by the weight of the fuel causing a bowing attitude during takeoff, 
fitting a smaller fuel tank allowing for another seat to be fitted leads to a reduction in trainer fatalities. To me, it was light and simple and served this military purpose for a long time. The heavier engines can be more powerful making it overkill. I've read that the impact of this torque in the air has made the Sopwith one of the most difficult airplanes to control but it does. Also allows the pilots to make a terrifying turn that can give them a huge advantage over other chasing planes. There will never be another warrior like Camel. In the hands of a novice, it exhibits evil traits that can make it a killer. But in the steady hands of a skilled pilot who knows how to turn vices to his advantage, it is one of the greatest fighting machines ever built. Robert Jackson once emphasized, for me, it was light and simple and served this military purpose for a long time. The heavier engines can be more powerful making it overkill. I've read that the impact of this torque in the air has made the Sopwith one of the most difficult planes to control but it does. Also allows the pilots to make a terrifying turn that can give them a big advantage over other chasing planes. There will never be another warrior like Camel. In the hands of a novice, it exhibits evil traits that can make it a killer. But in the steady hands of a skilled pilot who knows how to turn vices to his advantage, it is one of the greatest fighting machines ever built. Robert Jackson once emphasized, I will end my video here. Thank you for watching and listening. If you know more information about this aircraft, please comment below to discuss. As always, please like this video and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you will be one of the first to see my latest videos. In addition, maybe the voice in the video is not perfect, but the above content is my long-term research effort. I hope you understand so that I have the motivation to make the next good videos. And now it's time to hear from you guys. Guys. Guys.